Now, I appreciate the fact that this event has been put together because given the number of people who are here, it gives a very good indication as to the level of interest in the subject. The Apollo moon landings. Is it fact or is it fiction? What we're going to be looking at here are some of the anomalies, the inconsistencies and the unexplained details. And there are, believe it or not, a great many of them. But it happened. National Geographic, the world's top selling magazine at the time, this is from December 1969, wouldn't publish fake pictures, would they? 20 million people bought uh, National Geographic, we say bought Nexus, but bought National Geographic. At the time, they've been caught out many times. We're going to look at some of these pictures, but this is where the whole story ended. Man on the moon. And we believed it. We had no reason not to. We'd seen it live on television, which is one of the most remarkable achievements in scientific history, to transmit live television pictures 240,000 miles and get them picked up and transmitted around the world live. Has it ever happened since? No, it hasn't. If there are any TV or radio engineers, they will know the power required to transmit a television or radio signal. And it's measured in kilowatts, i.e. thousands of watts. Not the power that was carried on Apollo, which was three of the most kilowatts. Anyway, this is where it began. Nikita Khrushchev on the right, Yuri Gagarin, who we're told was the first man to orbit, them, orbit the Earth. There's a doubt about that, but I won't go into that now, because there's a lot of doubts about some of the Russian uh, achievements in space. Anyway, he was recognized as being the first man to orbit the Earth, and he was fated around the world. Well, it's not generally known, because a lot of this information you've got to dig out, you've got to find where it is, and put it all together. I've spent the last 20 odd years trying to do this. What is not generally known is that the week before Gagarin's flight, which was August, it was April the 14th, 1961, another flight had taken place, and it was reported by Bruce Jock Gardine, who was the Moscow correspondent for the Daily Worker, and a stringer for various other newspapers. There were various reports of another flight which took place, and the person on that flight the earlier flight to Gagarin was the logical choice for the Soviet Union, as it was then, to make. His name was Vladimir Ilushin. He was the son of the aircraft designer, a test pilot, an extremely competent flyer. Unfortunately, his craft came down in China. It missed Russia. It's very really difficult to miss Russia. It's the biggest country on the planet. He was badly injured, he, was, he recuperated in China, and he was returned to Russia about six months later. How do we know this? When Gagarin, allegedly the first man, orbited the Earth, he went on a world tour to promote the whole of Soviet achievements. And, and the diplomatic circuit, one group of people did not attend any reception, that was the Chinese. Did they know something that is not generally known. Right. Six weeks after Gagarin's flight, John Kennedy, President John Kennedy, stands up in the Joint House of Congress and makes his famous speech, we will land a man on the moon before the decade is out and return him safely to the earth. Three weeks earlier to that was the Bay of Pigs fiasco. Kennedy was by this time a marked man <coughs> in intelligence circles. So what else was going on? You have to view this in the context of its time. Project Apollo, 1961 to 72, or 75 in some cases, where the Apollo-Soyuz link-up happened. There's a great deal else going on. The Cold War, the space race, the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 62, when the world was going to end. We'll not get into the whole business of nuclear explosions, which can't just take place anywhere. 
they have to be properly targeted, but that's another story. Kennedy was assassinated, the Vietnam War was ramping up. Kennedy was trying to withdraw American troops from Vietnam. President Johnson, within a year of Kennedy's death, had increased their number by 10 times. By the time they withdrew from Vietnam in 1974, 58,000 Americans were dead, alongside 3 million Vietnamese. That is the price we pay in this world for incompetence. The student riots against the Vietnam War, people were literally being killed in the street because they were protesting. It was very, very violent times. Robert Kennedy was assassinated, Martin Luther King was assassinated. America was falling apart. It needed a distraction. Here was the distraction. Land a man on the moon before the decade is out. Wonderful. Kennedy, by this time, was now dead, so we had to fulfill, well, America had to fulfill their president's challenge. America, a very can-do nation, they decide to put their mind to something, they will achieve it. Or if they can't achieve it, they will make it appear that it has been achieved. So the American space program started with Mercury, one man in space, Gemini, two men in space, in low Earth orbit, that's 200 miles up. The Apollo moon landings, Skylab, again, low Earth orbit. The Space Shuttle, Low Earth Orbit, the International Space Station, it's still up there now, Low Earth Orbit. The Orion Craft, that's Apollo 2.0, we'll come to that later. How many people here have not only heard about, but know where the X-37B craft goes to? Thought not. Its last mission lasted 712 days. That's the X-37B. It looks like a small version of the space shuttle. It flies unmanned. Nobody knows where it goes to. Nobody knows who controls it. Nobody really knows who pays for it. Nobody knows what it does. But 712 days in space, that was the fourth mission. The third one was 515 days. So let's not have any more stories about you can't keep secrets. Nobody knows what the X-37B does. It's secret. A secret is kept. If people are charged with keeping a secret in the interests of national security, they keep it because they're honorable people. If they agree to do something, they will do it. Now, if you're gonna to fly to the moon, you need a bit of kit to do it in. The first piece of kit you need is a rocket. We know those exist. 360 foot high, the Saturn V rockets. You need a lander to land on the moon. You need a spacecraft to get from Earth to the moon. It's not very far, you can see the moon. So you need a spacecraft in which you're gonna have your own temperature and pressure controlled because in space there is no pressure and humans can't survive without pressure. You've gotta have a lander to get onto the lunar surface, so you've then got to come off the lunar surface again. That was in 1969 all this was happening. We're now in 2018, and they can't do it again. What's going on? Where's the technology? Oh, we lost it. Come on, give us a break. You don't lose technology that works. Did they lose technology that didn't work? The technology that lands man on the moon, 50 years later, we're nowhere near going anywhere near the moon again. It just doesn't add up. In 1927, Charles Lindbergh flew the Atlantic solo for the first time. 50 years later, jumbo jets were crossing the Atlantic on a regular basis. That's progress, that's human progress. In 1969, man lands on the moon. 50 years later, doesn't come anywhere near the place. Here's a bit of a mystery. This is the Gemini 6 craft, just landed. What's this? Wouldn't that have got burnt off if it came back through the atmosphere at uh, searing temperatures? It wasn't carried to the craft by the frogmen who were there to help the astronauts out. It's a bit of a mystery. 
begin to move and you want to take photographs. This is the camera that was used to take the photographs on the lunar surface, the Hasselblad 500 EL, electric motor drive camera. Top right hand is the picture of the camera and notice it had on the front of the lens a polarizing filter. You can't use a polarizing filter without a viewfinder to see if you've got it lined correctly. But they didn't have a viewfinder on this camera. The middle picture is the camera you can go into a shop today and buy. Hasselblad are very, very good cameras. It's mainly the lens that is so good. On the left is Neil Armstrong with his camera attached to his chest and on the right is Alan Shepard, similarly equipped. There's no viewfinder on this camera because if you're wearing a spacesuit and if you go outside here into the hall you'll see a very good representation of an Apollo spacesuit. If your camera is attached to your chest, which they were, you can't put your head anywhere near the viewfinder so you can't use it so they took it away. So there's no mirror which is the thing you hear when you take a picture, it goes up and down, clicks. It's got a shutter on the front of the camera, shutter button on the front of the camera. You can't see it from inside the spacesuit. And the only way you can see if you've taken a photograph is with a little dial. Top left, there are three dials. The one that counts the number of pictures is the middle one. But you can't see that from inside your spacesuit either. But we'll see some of these fantastically brilliant, iconic photographs that this camera and the people operating it took shortly. This was a replica of the Lunar Hasselblad camera, which was borrowed by a television company who I was uh, being interviewed for a few years back. So I took the opportunity to photograph it. <coughs> Very few people have actually seen this camera. It's no secret. Hasselblad UK have got it there. They'll lend it to you if you ask them very nicely. Bottom left-hand picture, the black square on the front of the camera is the shutter button. And on the right, bottom right, is showing the dials which tell you if you've taken a picture. Left-hand picture is what an astronaut would see from inside his spacesuit. There's no um, exposure meter on this camera. You've got a little chart on the top of the camera that tells you where the sun is and what you what the shutter speed, the app. This, this may all sound extraordinarily antiquated because we're all used to digital cameras. This is 20th century. This is a film camera. Film takes photographs, or records images very differently from digital images. That's a key point to know. On the left, the two pictures, one is photographed, the top picture is photographed at eye level, eye up here. And the bottom picture is taken with the camera at chest level. <clears throat> the point of those pictures is to show the relative position of, in this case, a fence behind. The higher you are, the higher will be the horizon in the picture. It's a matter of optics. It happens on the moon, it happens on Earth, probably happened on Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus when we get there. But on the moon and on Earth, the lower the camera position will be the lower will be the horizon. It's a key point. We'll come back to that later. If you're going to go to the moon, you may as well practice. And this is what they did. They built models. Bottom left picture of various scale models of the lunar surface with a camera track. Anybody who's worked with film will recognize that as a tracking camera position. Very logical. You set the camera going at one end and you bring it towards the surface of the moon so you've then got a film which you can project outside your simulator to show an astronaut what it would look like as he approaches the lunar surface. Of course you're going to do that. That's what they do when they train airline pilots. Airline pilots will be able to land at Heathrow because they can see what they assume is Heathrow outside their window. It's film. This is normal simulator position. On the right hand side, top right, very detailed pictures were taken of the lunar surface by the lunar orbiter craft and they were recreated on a very large scale model of, of the moon. The middle right hand picture is the moon before it became a large model. There's nothing secret about any of this. Forget Area 51, forget some secret studio in Nevada or Arizona or wherever they have there's nothing secret about any of this. This is all being filmed. A lot of people knew it was happening. 
There was nothing unusual about it. If anybody wants to go to Langley, Virginia, you can still see this contraption today. It's about 400 foot long, 200 foot high, and it was designed. Langley, interestingly enough, is relatively close to the CIA headquarters. To bottom left shows what would happen if you remove five sixths of the weight of the lunar lander in this case. So you could simulate landing on the lunar surface. Again, no secret about any of it. All right, let's go off to the moon. This is a famous Saturn V rocket, designed rather, it looks rather like a V2 rocket, because it was designed by the same man, Werner von Braun, who was a SS major. He brought with him a lot of his technical staff, Hermann Obach was one. There, have been a lot, there were a lot of Germans who worked for it. There's nothing wrong with the Germans working for it, but let's not hide the fact that they were Nazis. 360 foot high, 99% of the weight of 3,000 tons is fuel. At the top of it is the little capsule on which the astronauts sat. They had to be in that capsule because if the rocket unfortunately exploded on the uh, launch pad or didn't return to Earth correctly, you couldn't then have three live astronauts. That was the premise of the film Capricorn One. All right, when the rocket clears the tower, and until it splashes back down in the Pacific, there's only one source of information about what is going on. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or never a straight answer. Or numerous anomalies and scams abound, or the National Academy of Space Actors, take your pick. If you're going to go into space, you've got various challenges to overcome. You've got to build the Saturn V rocket. Those existed. Those worked, as far as we know. The key point about the Saturn V rocket is it used, this is technical, it used the, the F1 engine, so-called, that's just the way it was because there was another engine in it called the J2. The F1 engine was the most powerful rocket engine ever built. It's not even being considered for the space launch system, which is the new system. Because guess what? America has to buy its rocket engines from Russia. They, they don't even have the technology to build, let alone test, rocket engines. But they worked on the Saturn V rocket. So why did they then, when they built the space shuttle, have to get a completely new set of engines? Again, a mystery, it doesn't make sense. Now, if you're going into space, you've got to overcome three things, the heat, the radiation and the vacuum. What is the temperature of space? Space has no temperature. There's nothing in space to have a temperature until you put it there, like a spacecraft or the Earth or the Moon. Then it will have a temperature. What is the temperature of a spacecraft in space? 250 degrees Fahrenheit, 120 degrees centigrade. Hot. So you've got to keep it cool. How do you do that? Because you can't air condition it there's nowhere to dump the heat. Space is a vacuum. It's a very good insulator. You radiate it away. If you do the calculations, black body radiation, you'll find the temperature inside any spacecraft is too hot for human survival. The vacuum of space means that if you're going to go there, you have to take your own pressure with you, i.e. your spacesuits. Wonderful things, these spacesuits. They protected the astronauts against radiation, against heat and cold, provided them sufficient pressure to operate in. So I thought, well, they're obviously magic suits, these. Could anybody then use the same spacesuit and go into Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, or Fukushima, and help clear up the mess? So I asked NASA that question. Well, I asked the manufacturers of the spacesuits, a company called Hamilton Standard in Connecticut. I said, could these same spacesuits be used? And they said, you better ask NASA because we didn't put any radiation protection in the spacesuit. <laughs> what? There's no radiation protection in the spacesuit, and yet we know space is full of radiation. NASA still hadn't replied. <laughs> because you'd think it would be a logical thing to do. Right. And the final thing, and the most important thing, is if you've got yourself into space, which is a bit doubtful, 
going to the moon. I'm not talking about the International Space Station or the Space Shuttle. They were all for real, in my view. If you're going to come back from the moon, you come back at the same speed you left at. And in order to leave Earth's gravity, you have to accelerate to a speed of 25,000 miles an hour. So if you're coming back from the moon, you're coming back, you're being attracted by the Earth's gravity all the way back. If you're coming back, you've got to slow down, because you can't hit the Earth's surface at 25,000 miles an hour, you'll be toast. So you have a heat shield to absorb the frictional loads from hitting the Earth's atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere starts 60 miles up. So you're coming in 25,000 miles an hour, you hit the Earth's atmosphere at a very slight angle, 6.6 .6 degrees is the official figure, and you then slow down. Hang on, now that doesn't work. What would be the gravitational load on the astronauts in that craft if they were coming back at that speed? 34 G, they'd be dead. The heat shield, which they've now lost the formula for, was used or something approximating it was used on the Orion craft. We'll see that later. It didn't work. They've had to go back. Remember the Orion craft? December 2014, it had one test. We're now the summer of 2018. Half the time it took the whole Apollo program to start and complete has been taken up by the Orion program on developing its heat shield. The radiation in space is severe. If we didn't have the protection that we do on Earth, the Van Allen radiation belts, which are held in place around the Earth by the Earth's magnetic field, deflecting radiation generated by the sun, solar particle events, deep space, galactic cosmic rays. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't, this wouldn't be a habitable planet. We wouldn't be able to survive. We're not designed to survive in radiation. Let's get to the moon. Great photograph that, it's supposed to be the photograph which started the whole ecology movement, the whole movement of protect the earth. We saw it for the first time for what it really is, a beautiful place floating in this inky blackness of space. So let's protect it. It's fair enough. But was that photograph taken from lunar orbit, which is what we're told? Because here's the craft they were supposed to be flying in. This is the interior of the lunar lander. Notice the controls. You may recall, if you studied it as obsessively as I have and as other people have, there was an alarm went off as they were descending. This is Apollo 11, Armstrong, Aldrin, Collins was still orbiting the moon in his lunar uh, command module. Armstrong had to take over manual control of the landing of the spacecraft. There had been an alarm, 1202 alarm, which is actually a radar overread. And here are our heroes. Armstrong on the right, Aldrin on the left. And that was the control panel. Okay. If you remember, there was a fairly well-known piece of film, which is, is a commentary. The voice you hear is Aldrin reading out feet down, feet across, so that Armstrong could ensure that he had control of the craft. How could you hear what he was saying? There's a 10,000-pound thrust rocket three foot below them slowing them down. There are four adjusting rockets alongside them. Ah, oh, they're wearing their spacesuits. Of course you can hear them. Really? Would you operate a computer keyboard, which Armstrong is doing, between the two of them, there's a computer keyboard, into which he had to enter numbers and various commands, because he was doing this manually, would you operate a computer keyboard with armoured gauntlets, because you can't wear half a spacesuit, you've got to wear the whole thing. Gloves, helmet and boots. The gloves are armoured. They're pressurised. Would you operate a computer keyboard with those conditions if your life depended on it, which theirs did? I think not. Anyway, they got to the moon, so this is the circular argument. Well, of course they got to the moon. We got the photographs to prove it. You just go and ask them. They'll tell you we got to the moon. This is what it looked like. Yeah, right. Anyway, let's have a look at the photographs that they took. This is Armstrong taking the photographs. Don't forget his camera had no viewfinder. 
he had to manually set the shutter, the aperture, and focus it. It was a film camera, not a digital camera, and he had no exposure meter. This is a sequence of eight photographs that were taken. This is Aldrin coming out of the lander. Armstrong got bored watching him do it, so he decided to photograph the rubbish bag underneath the craft. And he wasn't helping him, obviously, you know, Aldrin might have slipped. Now let's photograph the, uh, one of the landing pads, which they had to do to make sure it wasn't damaged when they landed. They're quite what they'd have done if it had been, nobody tells us. Oh, he's come down a bit further. This is the most ridiculous photograph I have ever seen that is portrayed as being a true record of man on the lunar surface. Forget it. All right, here you are, on top of your garage. You just cleaned the roof, cleaned the gutter. You're 10 foot off the ground, and you've got to come down a ladder. Would you come down a ladder like that, with your right foot not even touching the rung, and your left foot stuck out at a stupid angle, as if you had done this maneuver a hundred times before in the simulation exercise, and you showed you've got a great sense of humor, and you can say, look, I can, I can bounce around on the top of this thing as much as you like. This is not a proper photograph. This was taken here on Earth under controlled studio lighting conditions by a professional photographer. Foot not on the rung, left foot hanging out. Where's all the light illuminating him from? They're in shadow at this point. The sun is behind the lunar lander or the light source, more than likely to be the sun. The ground directly illuminated on the left is not overexposed. And there's a highlight of light on his heel. Come on guys, this is not on the moon. This is in a simulation studio. Coming down a bit further. Again, you can see all the, you can see where the shadows are coming from, so you can see where the light is. This is in shadow, so where's the light coming from that's illuminating Aldrin? He's lit up like a Christmas tree. Oh, it's re light reflected off the lunar surface. Really? It could be earth shine. Really? Do a bit of a basic astronomy. Where would the earth be if you were actually on the lunar surface? Where would you look to see the earth? You'd look more or less straight up because the earth is more or less straight overhead, which is why when we see a full moon, we're looking straight at it. So when you're on the moon, you look to earth, you look straight up. It's not earth shine. The lunar surface has the reflectivity of tarmac. The amount of light hitting it, 8% is reflected. Any photographer will tell you that's not really enough to record on a film if you're going to expose to the directly illuminated surface, which is what we've got here. So this is an artificial light source, which they didn't carry, hence, is taken in the studio. His feet are right inside one of the pads, which is very dark, but there are, there are highlights of light on the heel. Where did that highlight come from? It couldn't possibly have come from this special reflective lunar surface, which all the Apollo fanboys keep moaning on about. And if you've read any of the websites which say that people like me are, need to be hospitalized, you'll see those sort of explanations, which are ridiculous. Clavius.org is one, Brawnyug is the other. There are, there are several websites where you can go and read refutation of everything I say. Not everything I say, because they don't refute half of it, actually. Those are the eight pictures in sequence. And any photographer who's used a camera and had a contact sheet, for those who are not familiar with the term, a contact sheet was you take the whole row of negatives that you've just exposed in your camera, and you print them on one sheet of paper so you can see the sequence in which you took them. That's what contact sheets were used for. You would then... Sorry? Like that. Sorry. Ah, oh, wow. Sorry about that, guys. I hope you haven't missed much. Come and see me afterwards if you need questions. Dear, oh dear. I'll get, I'll get the hang of this one day.
Right, eight photographs, contact sheet. This is the sequence they were taken in, and the reason I question it is because they didn't do any bracketing, which is exposure slightly higher, slightly lower. They didn't take duplicate photographs, which is what you'd expect, that's normal photographic practice. If you use a digital camera now, you can take as many photographs as you like, and if you don't like them, you just zip them away. With film camera, they're a permanent record. You can go onto any website, I use the Lunar and Planetary Institute website, and you can see them all in sequence. Then this is the key point, they should, if they're in sequence, you can then read what the photographer was doing as he took the various photographs. And we come now to the footprint on the moon. Oh, wow! Man must have been there to leave a footprint, mustn't he? If you think I'm being a little sarcastic and cynical, you're right, I am. Because we have been fooled by this ridiculous story of man landing on the moon, which is a political event. Nothing to do with science. It was all to do with the military and political. We'll come back to a little bit of that later. Right, footprint on the moon. How did he take this photograph? He had a camera on a chest. Did he take the camera off his chest and point it at his foot? How did he know it was in focus? How did he know it was the right exposure? And he took one picture. Forget it. On the moon, or assuming that this is the moon, on the moon, particles of lunar surface will not adhere to anything that has arrived from Earth. Because this is one of the foot pads of the lunar lander. When you heard the Aldrin saying, kicking up some dust, you'd expect it to be flying around all over the place, but it hasn't landed in the pad, which is a bit odd. What's going on? This is the only photograph of Neil Armstrong, allegedly, on the lunar surface. Have you seen another one? You see them of Aldrin, you don't see them of Armstrong. This was taken by Aldrin, because they only had one camera they used, which is again odd, because they had one camera each, but they only chose to use one. The point about this picture is, look at the flag. Look at the position of the flag. It is virtually below the horizon. The Sea of Tranquility, where they allegedly landed, is supposed to be flat. There are no hills. So the flag is more or less below the horizon level, which indicates a high camera position. And if you look at Armstrong, assuming that is Armstrong and not some actor, you're looking down on him. The camera should have been on chest level, which means you should be looking up. We'll see even more dramatic pictures later. Look at the flag in this picture. It's above the horizon. What's going on? The camera position is different. This is a picture of Aldrin saluting the flag. That's fine. I've got no problem with the American flag being put up on the moon because they're the guys who allegedly got there. But there's something odd about this picture. It's the one-legged astronaut. You've got a footprint going in one direction, but there's nothing in front of it or behind it. Bit of a mystery, that. Here we have two astronauts, this is Armstrong and Aldrin, on the lunar surface at the same time. That's fine. They're being filmed from what's called the data acquisition camera, which is a cine camera mounted in the window, taking one frame per second the whole time they were on the lunar surface. But the point about this picture is not so much that there are two of them, as one we'll come to later, which is not okay, is the sun angle and their shadow lengths. They're both men of about six foot. They should have the same length shadow cast by the sun. It's not. One shadow is much longer than the other. Why? It's not going to be a separate light source. It's just a bit of a mystery. The ground is quite level at this point. There are no major hills. We saw it in the earlier picture here. The ground is quite level. So the, the argument that, well, if you photograph it on the uneven ground, of course it will show up. Now, the angles there are 25 degrees and 35 degrees, but when they landed 
at this time we're told the angle the sun was above the horizon was 13 degrees. So we've got all these anomalies and unexplained details that are part of the whole Apollo story. Now here's a good one. Top left picture is the flag that we've just seen. The bottom right picture, the bigger picture, shows the same flag in a film. This is a screen grab from one of NASA's officially uh, official films about the Apollo 11 landing. You can see at the bottom, it's, uh, it's on YouTube now. But look at the flag position. It's completely different. The, that little white spot, uh, a little white stick behind the flag is the TV camera tripod or unipod. They didn't touch the flag after they put it in position. Oh, by the way, there's no waving flags on the moon. They didn't leave any hangar doors open. They weren't that stupid. There are no stars in the photographs because the camera, the film used, was not sufficiently sensitive enough to record directly illuminated surface and the stars which are relatively faint. But there are stars in the sky. They just chose not to photograph them. And Stanley Kubrick had very little to do with it. So how did the flag position change? Memo to set dresser, remember your previous set. On, the on all film is usually information about the film. When it was shot, the subject matter, the cameraman, and on all the Apollo films, you get this little chart showing who was involved. But look at the date, top of the screen. These are two from the Apollo 11 series. 11th of July is five days before the official launch of Apollo 11. Launched on, on July the 16th. Did they shoot everything before they left? That's what it appears. The photographer here is a chap called Gines. He did work for NASA until about 10 years ago. There is an inspector, photographic inspector called Jones. So you've got all these anomalies which don't add up to the truth. They add up to disinformation. Camera position again. Where's the camera position here? It's above the astronaut. What on earth is going on in those two lights in the left? There is lens flare. In the center of the picture is the shape of the Hasselblad shutter, which is inside the lens. And you do get lens flare of that shape, but you don't get highlights of light and enormous great sort of streaks in the background, unless they just didn't airbrush out all the warehouse in which they shot it. Here we have Man on the Moon, one of those iconic photographs that we're all told is evidence of man's great ability to travel in space and survive. Oh, wonderful. Wow. Isn't it great? When I first, when I first started doing this um, investigation, this was, the first, this was the only piece of information I could find. I had to go and get a, a postcard of the Apollo photographs, because they didn't have the internet back in those days, early 90s. And this is the one that I was able to convince Jeremy Clarkson that uh, we didn't land on the moon, which he was very pleased to hear because he doesn't like America. Well, that's what he said anyway. But notice that the, the picture on the right is the official tidied up, enhanced version of the alleged true picture. They've added a bit of black at the top, not very well, but they've added it on, as if people weren't going to notice these things. Here we have another picture, a couple of pictures from Apollo 11. We'll move on to the next other Apollo craft in a minute. But this is just one of those, again, weird images that we're expected to believe until you start looking at it in, an, in enough detail to ask the question, how did they take this photograph? They're quite close to the lunar lander. They've got the Earth, which is more or less overhead. How did they take it? Did they take the camera off their chest and point it up in the sky and hope they get it in the right place? 
Well, he only took two pictures, slightly different positions. No. They'd had to have leaned over so far backwards if the camera was on their chest, they'd fall over. It makes no sense. And we're being asked to believe this nonsense. We're being asked to believe that man's landed on the moon and taken all these wonderful iconic photographs with a camera that had no viewfinder, no exposure meter, manual control of all the operations, using armored gauntlets. Would you take your wedding photographs under those conditions? No, of course you wouldn't. You'd expect to get a decent result. Here are our heroes. This is taken from, I put them in this format, because they're taken from a book bought at the Kennedy Space Center. And the top photograph says, astronaut Edwin Aldrin inside the lunar module after his moonwalk. If you go onto the websites where you can see all the photographs, you'll find that this was not taken after his moonwalk. It was taken just after he allegedly left Earth. You can find it. The photograph below is Neil Armstrong. As he rested in the lunar module after his moonwalk. Possibly he did. One of those simulation exercises, because if you look at his eyes, you will see a highlight of light. Armstrong on the right, Aldrin on the left. There's a highlight of light in his eye, which is a giveaway indicator of a flash gun being used. Look at any celebrity photograph. Most photographers will be taking pictures with flash guns to provide enough illumination so that you can see what you're looking at. If you look at the eyes, you'll see a little highlight of light in the eyes. It's the telltale giveaway. But they didn't have any flash guns in Apollo, in the Apollo craft. And as somebody pointed out rather inexpertly, well, it couldn't be a flash gun because there's no red eye. Oh, come on. You get red eye when the flash gun on your camera is so close to the lens that it is reflected back off the retina in the eye, hence red eye. If you have a flash gun, it's mounted above the camera, so it will avoid red eye. So these were taken during the training and simulation exercises. Anybody say different? Now, let's move on to Apollo 12 and some of the rather poor retouching that these guys managed to do. If you enhance the picture, which we've now got the ability to do, we can take pictures and enhance them and look into the, some of the detail which has been uh, obliterated. And here we have a rather poor attempt at what's called retouching. I block out the bits you don't want people to see and make it all black. Here's another sequence of eight photographs taken on Apollo 12. Again, in sequence. Two photographs of the same astronaut, in this case Al Bean, but look at the horizon. It's completely different. As if they were taken from different camera positions, which they, they were. The top picture you're looking down on him, the bottom picture you're looking more as if he were taking a picture with a camera at chest level. When you start looking into some of the details of it, all Apollo photographs had little crosshairs on them. This is just a screen inside the camera. We never really worked out why they had to have it. It was supposed to be to do with the measurement of distance. It's helpful in that it tells you, you can see which, which photographs were taken with cameras allegedly on the lunar surface. In the visor, you see that he's, um, his, his hand is fairly well below the camera. He may have been using his pistol grip, which they all had. But again, a different position. Now, if you look in the visor here, what, what are those lights? Where are they? What's all that about? Is it reflections off the visor? There are only three surfaces inside the visor, the gold one, the clear one, and the protective one. So how come you got six lights? Was it E.T. flying past saying, what on earth are these guys doing here? Who gave them permission to land? Tell them to get off. It's a more likely story than uh, whatever that's supposed to be. Right. 
Again, if you start looking into detail, you'll find that there's two little red circles at the top indicate crosshairs which shouldn't be there. So there have been double exposures being made, there's all sorts of manipulation going on. Before we get the, this is, these are the official NASA images. Light seems to travel in very odd directions on the moon. I'm not saying there are two light sources, because then you get different shadows as well. But how come you've got the photographer with the sun behind him, and this Surveyor 3 craft with the shadow at a completely different angle? You'd expect it to be at least similar position, but it's not. And then we have this ridiculous photograph. The sun is behind the photographer, so what's it doing illuminating a rock with an angle at right angle degrees? The shadow at right angle degrees. Again, anomaly, a mystery. Right, here we have one of those great iconic photographs, lunar lander on the moon. Where did all the light come from in the front of the craft which is in shadow? Oh, it's reflected off this special lunar surface which nobody's ever seemed to duplicate. You can buy lunar simulant material, which is what Tom Hanks did when he made from the, Ma from the Earth to the Moon mini-series. And when anybody tries to photograph the Moon, they go to a company called Orbitech, and you can buy it by the kilo, it costs $30 a kilo. You can get simulated Martian soil. You can get it from anywhere. How do we know it's anywhere near the same? How do we know they're not using it here? Right, here we have one of the great ridiculous pictures of all time. We've seen quite a few of them already. We flip this one over for this reason, that this is Apollo 14, where Alan Shepard, who was the commander, oh by the way, the commander of the mission, in this case Alan Shepard, could land the craft. But Ed Mitchell couldn't, because he hadn't been trained to. Buzz Aldrin hadn't been trained to. Al Bean hadn't been trained to. Would you fly in an aircraft that only had a pilot who could land the plane? Because what would happen if the pilot got incapacitated? You'd hope the co-pilot at least could land the damn thing, because he'd been trained to do so. On Apollo, no, no, only one person could land it. Ridiculous. All right. Alan Shepard took a golf ball onto the moon, and in his autobiography called Moonshot, yeah, get it? Moonshot golf ball was this picture. Here he is with his golf club and there on the top right is the golf ball flying off into the distance and there's Ed Mitchell and there's the craft. And I use that picture because you'll notice on the right hand side there's what looked like a checkerboard uh, object up against the, the leg of the lander which has the uh, ladder on it and in this picture you'll see the same checkerboard object where it's the same image that was used. This is five different images and for many years that this picture was displayed in the Kennedy Space Center in pride of place until we uh, challenged NASA to prove how it was made because it wasn't labeled a composite which is what it is. They took it down. That is the video still from the same scene. This is what they try to recreate. But the picture is photographs, because it's got crosshairs in it. Moving on to Apollo 15. Uh, Apollo 13. Should we just cover just Apollo 13? It was a complete sham. The evidence would indicate that the craft came down in the Atlantic. Because one day after the official launch of Apollo 13, you know the one that, big excitement, because it was going to go to the moon, swing around the back and come back, and they didn't have enough oxygen, and were they going to survive, and we are all on tenterhooks, and we were praying, and all the rest of it. Rubbish. 24 hours after launch, the Russians collected from the Atlantic the Apollo command module. They took it back to Mamansk and handed it over to America on what's called the, uh, the, it was a Coast Guard cutter called the South Wind, which visited Mamansk in 1970. You can check it all out, it's all documented. This Apollo command module is photographed on the deck of the South Wind. 
Right, Apollo 15 landed at the Hadley Rill. This is this little strange uh, channel, which we're told is a collapsed volcanic tube. Well, seeing as we've had no volcanoes on the moon that anybody's ever seen or identified, we don't quite know what it is. I think they had a load of JCBs up there and dug a big trench. But this is what it looked like from the ground. This is the landing site, and behind it is Mount Hadley Delta, 13,000 foot high. About two and a half miles, allegedly, above the lunar surface. If we look at a similar image on Earth, this is what we get when we look at Everest and Everest Base Camp. Everest Base Camp, 19,000 foot, Everest 29,000 foot, about 10,000 foot, two miles above Base Camp. That's what you'd expect to see. Not this little hump. And look at the very distinct difference between the foreground from just behind the lander and the background which has no detail at all. This is the best cameras you can buy. You'd expect to get more detail. They're using front screen projection which is the link with Stanley Kubrick because he used it in the film 2001 A Space Odyssey for the dawn of man sequence at the beginning of the film. And another weird picture. I've double checked these numbers. This is from the same roll of film that these two images are taken. Dave Scott, photographed by Jim Irwin. And the right-hand picture, Jim Irwin, photographed by Dave Scott. But Jim Irwin hasn't got a camera. Has Dave Scott got it? Did he give it to him? How did, the, how did those two pictures get taken? Again, anomaly between the official record and the reality of an investigation. Where's the flag? The flag was always the first thing to be planted. It's in the top picture, it's not in the bottom picture. And where did they put the lunar rover? We're told it was on the right hand side of the craft. So what's it doing on the left with no tracks? This is the Apollo 17 landing site. They landed more or less in the middle of this Taurus Litro Valley, which is a reasonable place to land, a bit dangerous possibly, but they managed to land. It's about five miles across, so there's plenty of room. But look at the length of the shadows. It's the sun is quite low below the horizon. It, it, it's a normal choice of the Apollo landers. They wanted to land in good shadow definition places. But where are the shadows in the background? And if you look at an equivalent photograph from Apollo 11, you get the terminator. That's the difference between dark and light. On Earth we call it dusk. On the moon it's fairly clear cut. It's a termination between sunlight and darkness on a circular body. So is what would happen. So where is it on Apollo 17? Any astronomer here can tell me. I'd love to know because I've never got an answer to that one. Oh, I love this. Apollo 17, Jack Schmidt, Harrison Schmidt, used to be a US senator. He should know better. <coughs> Taken by Gene Cernan. Right, you've got your mate, you've got the US flag, and in this case you've got Earth. Try to recreate that here on Earth. Use anybody you like, stick a flag in the ground, and try to get the moon in at the same time, with the flag pointing at the moon. It's very difficult. I've tried it. It's almost impossible to do it, and to expose it correctly with no viewfinder. Don't forget you've got no viewfinder on this. You can't see where your camera is pointing, let alone what's in the right position. So we're expected to believe that these photographs were taken on the lunar surface by the named astronauts using the designated equipment. I don't think so. Moving on to the ground on Apollo 17. In that photograph is the lunar lander. We'll come back to it in a minute. Enhancing the background gives an indication there's something going on, an indication that possibly this is the artifact of front screen projection. What we've got here on this screen is, is back screen projection. The projector is behind the screen, so it's back projection. Front projection is when the image is reflected off the screen. 
It's used, it was used in films. It was used in film 2001, Space Odyssey, by Stanley Kubrick. He was one of the first filmmakers to use it because it's a very efficient way of incorporating an outdoor scene, which he did for the dawn of man, which were photographs taken in Africa, projected onto a screen so actors could then do their bit in front of it and not cast shadows onto the screen because of the position of the camera and the screen and the projector itself. It's a very clever system and it worked very well. Okay, in that picture is the lunar lander. A bit hard to see it, but it is there. Let's enlarge it. It's a long, long way away. Maybe about three miles away from the camera position. This takes a bit of reading. The center picture is the one we just looked at. The top picture and the bottom picture show the same features A, C, A, B, D, E the same features in the same relative positions but the lunar lander is not in the same relative position an anomaly an unexplained detail something which shouldn't actually happen and the lunar lander jumps around all over the place on the left B, D and E are the same features in the two photographs. Little crater, little hill, the angle of the hill. On the, right, on the top picture on the right hand side is the lunar lander and the bottom picture on the left hand side is the same lunar lander. It's not supposed to have moved once it had landed, assuming it did, and the set dressers didn't get it right. It's not in this picture on the bottom, but it is in the picture at the top. You'd think it would be in all pictures taken with a similar background, but you don't. And then the lunar rover, oh, magic vehicle, this one, $60 million it cost. It could travel, we're told, 20 miles on the lunar surface on one battery pack. Batteries? We can hardly do that today. The Tesla goes a little bit further. But where are the wheel tracks? Plenty of footprints. The thing weighs on the moon about 70 pounds on earth 460 pounds you expect it to leave some sort of track and you see lots of pictures where it does leave tracks but on this occasion it doesn't is it a model? that's more likely to be the case you can take a close up of it but you don't want to move it too much because it would leave tracks but it hasn't left them there's a chap in the seat driving it here again unexplained detail then you look at the photograph showing these famous wheel tracks and you see this is the same roll of film as this picture AS17134 there's a herringbone track in that one and a straight line in that one it's the, the continuity has been taken different Ah, oh, here we go. We're going we're gonna to blast off from the lunar surface. Top left, the two halves of the lunar lander will separate. Explosive bolts will fire to sever all the connections between the top part where the astronauts are and the bottom part where all the engine is and the fuel. If those explosive bolts don't fire absolutely at the right time, the, the correct time that they all fire at the same time the craft's going to go spinning off but it didn't it jumps up as if it's on a bungee rope it's using the same fuel as the space shuttle bottom left where you see when the, when the shuttle maneuvering systems fire you see a flame and you see exhaust but you don't on the lunar lander the bottom right picture there is nowhere for the exhaust of this rocket to go that's not a hole in the middle it's just an indentation where the skirt of the rocket engine sat there's nowhere for the exhaust to go why weren't they fried 
This is 4,500 pounds of thrust, this rocket. It's not a firecracker. This is a major piece of kit. And they're expecting us to believe that this happened six times with no failures, no fried astronauts. Everybody returned safely. Because if you're going to come back to Earth, you've got to have a heat shield. This is the only photograph, photograph, of Earth that I've ever found. Everything else has been a computer-generated image. And you can always tell this, it's, it's the most frequently used image of Earth, and it shows above the Sudan a little triangle of cloud. Every time you see a photograph of Earth, it's more likely the one you're going to see. So when you come back to Earth, you need a heat shield. This is made of ablative material. Ablative material is when it gets hot, it will basically destroy itself and protect the inhabitants of, in this case, the craft from the heat. Because they've only got 60 miles to slow down. There are two types of entry that you can have. One is called direct entry, which is where you come straight in and slow down very, very fast indeed. And when you get down to about three miles, you open your parachutes and you come into the Pacific. The other entry, which is what the, what the Russians use, is called skip entry, where you come into the atmosphere and you bounce off it. And then you come back in again at a slower speed. That is a much more realistic entry. But Apollo didn't do that, despite what people have tried to claim differently. There are people now who will claim that, oh, Apollo used skip re-entry. No, they didn't. They used direct entry which would kill virtually anybody anywhere near it. So, the objections to all I've been saying, why didn't the Russians blow the whistle? What about the moon rocks? There are plenty of those. They can only have got those from the moon because we know that they're from the moon. And these reflectors, you can bounce laser beams off. Well, they could only have been put there by astronauts because they have to be specially angled to the correct position. Okay, let's have a look at some of it. The Russians. How many people here use Russian natural gas? Probably not that many because we don't import that much of it into Britain. We bring it in from Qatar and from Norway. However, in September 1968, an agreement was signed between the then Soviet Union and the governments of West Germany, Austria and Italy to import Russian natural gas. Russia has very few natural resources, with the exception of natural gas, which is their main export market. They signed this agreement to the supply of natural gas into West Germany, Italy, and Austria. If Russia thought that there was, America was trying to do some stupid little stunt on the moon, well, they could let them get on with it, because they had far more important matters to deal with in the survival of their country through the sale of natural gas. The deal is called Pipes for Gas. West Germany built the pipes, 2,000 kilometers of it. Russia supplied the gas. And Rolls-Royce supplied the compressors because you can't just stick a pipeline into a gas field. You have to drive it down the pipeline. Hence, you need a compressor. It was big business. They weren't going to make a fuss about it. And anyway, they knew enough about Russia's um, falsification of the Gagarin story to know that if they, which had been tracked and they had lost astronauts, Gagarin was the first one to land successfully and safely. There had been at least three, if not four others before him, which had been recorded by two Italian brothers in Turin who were listening in to the Russian transmissions from their spacecraft. So they knew what was going on. The Americans knew what was going on. The Russians knew the Americans knew what was going on. So it's a matter of political stalemate. The new pipeline is being built across the Baltic. It's called Nord Stream 2. So forget the Russians. They're not going to blow the whistle on anybody. But what about the rocks? Well, we've got this piece of rock here. I've got a piece of rock here. That's a piece of moon rock. It's rather nice. It's called breccia. It's a, it's a 
combination of different material. How do you know it's a piece of moon rock? Because I say so. How do you know it isn't a piece of moon rock? Well, you could analyze it. It's a piece of moon rock. Anybody from NASA here will probably come and arrest me because I'm not supposed to have a piece of moon rock. Well, that's another story. It was all stolen about 15 years ago. They got it back. The guy who stole it got eight years in jail. Right, here's a piece of moon rock that was uh, in the Rijksmuseum in Holland and it was uh, part of their space display. When the Rijksmuseum was being renovated about five or six years ago, they decided they examined this piece of moon rock, the geologists in Leiden University in Holland. And guess what? It was a piece of wood. Petrified wood. He was really scared. Treasured piece of the Dutch National Museum, a supposed moon rock from the first manned lunar landing, is nothing more than petrified wood, curators say. When NASA were asked to explain it, they said, we don't have enough information. It may well be that this particular moon rock, which is quite large, it's by the size of this piece of moon rock here, this isn't the same piece. When moon rock was supplied to virtually all nations around the world and all American states by NASA to commemorate their great achievement, they didn't supply what you'd think would be something like that. A piece of, that's a piece of moon rock. Something large, something you can touch, see, weigh, measure, examine. No, they supplied tiny little grains of dust encapsulated in plastic. A plastic, uh, uh, plastic display case as if that is supposed to uh, account for and explain the whole Apollo mission so it was a piece of moon rock but it wasn't it was a piece of petrified wood so what else have they falsified ah he you say no they photographed the Apollo landers on the lunar surface here we have Apollo 11, 15, 16, 17, and 14 of the lower picture. Wow! This is fantastic. What a great achievement. This is something we can now all dismiss. These crazed conspiracy theorists who claim we didn't land on the moon because the evidence doesn't support it. Because we've got the evidence that they did. No, they didn't. They're still lying to us. And I've heard of Photoshop too. In order to show anything, you need a whacking great arrow pointing at basically a white blob and a little black mark. But no, if you enlarge Apollo 12, you can see the footprints. You can see the astronauts' footprints on the lunar surface. How wonderful is that? Oh dear, oh dear, they still think we're stupid. How come the footprints are as wide as the lander? I, this must be a giant that landed on the moon. If your footprints are the same width as the lander, which is 20 foot wide, he's a big lad. So the intrepid descent stage, that is the lander. Surveyor 3 is the unmanned craft we saw in an earlier picture. All you can see is a little white blob. Let's have a look at an aerial photograph, this is the London Eye photograph 10 years ago by satellite 400 miles above the Earth's surface and you can see on the London Eye the individual pods and in a car park in the top left you can see individual cars and if you really look at it you can even see if they've got a sunroof this is what you expect to see from a decent satellite image not that. This was taken 30 foot above the lunar surface by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter in 2009 through the vacuum of space which would have no discernible effect on the quality of the image and yet we're expected to believe that that is the best that can be produced when this is also perfectly capable of being produced here on Earth. Come on, NASA, get your act together. At least use decent equipment. And why is 
the NASA picture in black and white when they had perfectly good color picture, color cameras. Because 60 years earlier, they were photographing the Copernicus crater, which is in the top, in the center of the moon, about slightly to the left of center. This is what you expect to see. This was taken with the unmanned lunar orbiter craft. And this, we're told, is an impact crater. No, it's not. It's not an impact crater at all. There are impact craters on the lunar surface. This isn't one of them. This is 60 miles across and two miles deep. That's not how impact craters work. This is an impact crater. Meteor crater in Arizona. The diameter of a crater created by an impact is eight times the diameter is eight times the depth. So this is about 4,000 feet across, and about 500 feet deep. The Sedan Crater, by the way, is what happens when you let a nuclear bomb off underground. It creates a nice deep crater. Glad they're not doing that anymore. So what we're looking at on the lunar surface is not impact craters, not the big ones. In my view, they are electrical discharge craters. By the close passage of an electrically charged body, i.e. another planet, possibly the planet Venus, which is recorded as having passed close to the Moon and the Earth in historical times. Again, that's another story. But on the lunar surface, photographed by the lunar, lunar orbiter in 1966, before anybody had landed there, is this strange object. I don't know what it is. There's one at the bottom, which is a big one. There's one at the top, which is a smaller one that's traveled a bit further. They've rolled up out of the crater across the lunar surface. When at NASA were asked to explain it, they said, oh, that's easy. They said, this is uh, rocks dislodged by moonquakes. Well, if that's the case, why didn't it dislodge any of the other ones? There are plenty of rocks around. That previous photograph, this photograph, this photograph here is the first, the only photograph I'd ever found of this image until this one appeared, which appears to indicate the same object, but the track is slightly different. It could be the sun angle is different, but if you put them together, yeah, they do look similar. But nobody's ever tried to explain it, and nobody's ever been, I don't know what it is. Could be a rock rolling along, but a rock does not leave a track like that. If you roll a beach ball across a sand, it'll leave a track that is narrower than the diameter of the ball itself. These tracks are the same width as the object making them. So let's come back to Earth. Here we are, 25,000 miles an hour, 2,700 degrees centigrade, very, very hot. Do you think it might melt aluminium? Well, of course it'll melt aluminium. Aluminium melts at about 600 degrees. This is the Apollo 14 command module. Quite undamaged. Little bits all over it that aren't um, damaged at all. Uh, this is the Apollo 2.0, the Orion craft, which is covered in heat shield. The whole thing is covered in heat. Why? They're using the, the heat shield tiles from the space shuttle. You'd think that if it was so easy to land the Apollo craft without all these heat shield bits and pieces. That's what they'd do, but no. You go to the Science Museum in London, top left, Apollo 10 command module is on display. Bottom right is the Orion command module covered in heat shield. NASA are beginning to find that the Apollo myth that they believe for so long is actually detrimental to future space travel. And here are our heroes, who look like the naughty schoolboys discovered behind a bike shed smoking fags. Come on, these are guys who've done the greatest scientific achievement, the greatest adventure in humankind, and they look completely out of it. They look bored, they look embarrassed. If you've been asked to lie to the world, you might look a bit embarrassed. Aldrin on the left, Armstrong in the middle, Collins on the right. 
famous question asked by uh, Patrick Moore, who was at that press conference. Could you see stars from space? Armstrong's answer was so non-committal, you have to think he wasn't there in the first place. So has anything been learnt from Apollo? Orbiting the moon with unmanned satellites appears to be simple, straightforward. That's not a problem, unmanned satellites, because you can protect the internal working of the satellite. It's called hardening against the radiation. Landing astronauts on the moon and returning them safely to the Earth, that is the really hard part. Because reaching the moon isn't actually that much diff that difficult. It's getting the astronauts back alive. That's the hard bit. So what was Apollo all about? It was occupying the high ground. Demonstrating to anybody who cared to take notice, yeah, America are pretty good at occupying the high ground, which is low Earth orbit. Then you control the world. Who controls the world? I'm at astronaut four on this one, bottom right. Because his creator is most likely to have had a considerable hand in creating the fantasy of Apollo. That is what Walt Disney could do, create fantasy. As to who worked on the whole Apollo fantasy, there's one man that actually stands out as having credible achievement behind him in exactly the type of activities which would be required to produce the Apollo images. Because if you're experienced in using models, radio controlled, motion capture, periscope cameras, i.e. you're filming miniature models which when projected onto a screen look as if they are real, there's one man who stands out above all others, and this is possibly the link with Kubrick. It's his special effects director, Douglas Trumbull. He did the special effects on 2001, he did the special effects on Back to the Future, on um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. If you look, he's, he's still alive, I believe. He's still working, he's trying to spot UFOs using advanced camera equipment, so he's, he's on the right track. But he's a man who had enormous expertise. If anybody's interested in looking in detail at the, the evidence for the fakery behind it, there is a film called Make Believe Smoke and Mirrors, which is a two and a half hour film, incredibly technically advanced, explaining how the whole thing was done. There's one problem, you can't hear the commentary because the author of the film wanted to maintain his anonymity. We don't know who it was who's, who did it. Somebody has taken that film, split it into parts, put a commentary on it, which is, or put subtitles on it, which, are, which do match the original commentary. And one of the people identified is Douglas Trumbull. So if anyone is interested in how it was done, that was how it was done. Again, nothing secret. Douglas Trumbull had a record of working for NASA, working on space programs. There are other people who've done all this investigation. I'm just one person who happens to be sufficiently interested in it to have spent the last 25 odd years looking into this whole story of Apollo. Because I find it fascinating how so many people can be manipulated to believe something which when you get the evidence together is quite evidently fake. It's called, um, it's basically making enough people believe so. You can f it's easier to fool people than it is to persuade them that they have been fooled, as Mark Twain is alleged to have said. There are other people who made similar sort of comments. In many cases, as we've all discovered through the UFO experience, we can be manipulated into believing things, i.e. that UFOs don't exist. We can be manipulated into believing that man has landed on the moon, because it, it is to the advantage 
of groups of people, in this case the military industrial complex, who get the money for doing all these defense spending. But there are people who worked on this. Maybe Percy and Mary Bennett for their book Dark Moon. It's probably the definitive book on the subject, as is their DVD, What Happened on the Moon. Jack White, if you go to the Owlis website, you'll see all his work there. The photo analyst, he's passed away now. Bill Casing, Ralph Rene. Maybe NASA just waiting for everybody to die off, because Ralph Rene and Bill Casing are both dead. Gerhard Wydniewski for his book One Small Step. And anybody who's, who really wants to get up to date, if you like YouTube binges, look at Jarrah White's work on moonfaker.com because you can tell from the name of the website where he's coming from. But you should also give credit to NASA. They have at least put all their information up on, online. But there are people around the world who are working on this. I know people from 10 different countries, from New Zealand and Australia to America to Germany to Thailand to France to Britain, to Russia. You've got all the, these people are all working together. They, they come up with little good bits of information. There's a very good guy in Canada called Scott Henderson who spent a long time looking in detail at many of the photographs. And he's identified so much new information because people are coming to it for the first time and looking at it and saying, I don't believe I've been fooled for this long. And they're starting to look at it and saying, yeah, that's not right. That's not right. How can you explain it? And NASA will not address this. NASA will not respond. They use their fanboys to have a go. Oh, people say rude things about me, and people say rude things about other people. Occasionally I get things wrong. That illustration at the beginning of the National Geographic, I said it was from December 1968. And I was jumped on. How can you be so stupid? Of course it wasn't 1968. No, I made a mistake. It was there in front of me. I'm human. I'm not an alien. I, I want to see the truth because we now have the president's dilemma. G.W. Bush said, we're going to go back to the moon and maybe on to Mars. Obama says, forget the moon, let's go to Mars. Trump says, forget Mars, let's just go back to the moon. A week after he said that, NASA said, we can't go to the moon, we're going to cancel it. Now, whatever one thinks of Trump, he has a very short tolerance of incompetence. He's likely to call out NASA. Or they say, well, explain how you did it so easily 50 years ago, and why you can't do it today, because that is the case. They can't do it today. That is not the way it worked. So I would claim that the Apollo record that we have been fed is primarily fictional, designed to mislead us to believing the superiority of American technology. Now, American technology is very good, there's no doubt about that. But not in this case. The, the real leaders of space technology are the Russians. They supply all the rocket engines for all the American sat uh, rocket launches. They also fly everybody up to the International Space Station on the Soyuz rockets. America can't do it, Britain can't do it, France can't do it, China can't do it. The Russians are well ahead. They've had the last laugh. And they will expose this fiction by gradually demonstrating the inability of humans to travel beyond the radiation of space. So until that happens, we just have to keep watching the skies, hoping that ET is going to come back and say, OK, this is how you do it. It's a matter of manipulation of space-time. Anybody hasn't, uh, has heard of white powder gold, you'll know that white powder gold is one of the ways it's used to manipulate space-time. It's also a superconductor. It's worth looking into that. We're on the verge of breakthroughs now, which is going to revolutionize space travel. But until that happens, we've got to live with the fiction of Apollo. So until we get the truth, I thank you for your attention. I thank you for your interest. I hope you found it sufficiently um, persuasive that you can now argue the case that nobody has landed on the moon. Until then, thank you very much.